and finally using digital technologies. So I think that is a that's a differentiator because a lot of those technologies that we have used in the past, and that was like pulling your hair out, right? That kind of you, you never were quite happy with them. There was a lot of asymmetry in the information architecture. Uh, you didn't quite know there was a lot of uncertainty. Imagine five, ten years back, any of us who would have gone to a hill station and done the booking, I and mean, then must have been half a dozen phone calls. And then you have to, okay, I'm going to make a demand draft and I'm going to mail it to you because there were, those hotels were not on the network. They were not on make my trip. So you have to do all that kind of stuff. Taxi is always that whether the guy will show up or not or who will show up. Is he a serial killer who is carrying the shotgun in the car? We don't know what, what kind of a world we are in, right? When you are sending your loved ones, I mean, I send my the, the Bangalore, thanks to the Bangalore airport, we all have become very impolite and uncivil because there is no way you can go to see off or receive off your relatives to the airport. Right, that's uh, that's kind of side effects of development. So you have to trust the 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 service delivery, the taxi guy, to basically make sure that I I have the right guy who I'm sending my mom there, I'm sending my loved ones there. They will be taken care of. It's like 45 kilometers, anything can happen, right? So you need to make sure that there is enough technology. You are tracking, you are tracking real time, everything is fine there, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of digital technologies are there. This is my take on what digital means to me. By no means exhaustive, but this probably covering most of it. So, then when we apply that to an organization, what does it mean? How does an organization uh, become a digital organization, right? So, let's, let's look at uh, what does it really mean. To me, a digital organization, I mean, these are long definitions, not to be consumed here, I'll upload the deck later on. But uh, to me, basically, a digital organization is something that utilizes the technology at the core to really offer those services to the customers. And there are, there are some other definitions also that place customer in the core. But key thing is, when you triangulate a lot of those definitions, two things that come out very loud and clear is, one is the technology that is at the core, second is customer is at the core. So anything that we build around them is, is kind of uh, uh, digital organization. What are the key constituents of the digital organizations? I, I, have, I have chosen these five uh, based on what I believe are the, uh, they have the major impact. So I'll talk briefly about them, services, technology, way of working, operations, and finally the culture. Let's look at each one of them. So when we talk about digital services, today we have started to become unconsciously and subconsciously aware of those digital services. Um, what are those services? For example, these could be omnichannel digital experiences, right? So, so last two months, uh, I, I've been working on kind of changing my car. So I've been kind of looking at uh, some particular uh, um, uh, makes and models, and now I see whichever website I go to, I'm kind of seeing those ads there, right? Because somebody has smartly put those cookies on my browser, and I'm kind kind of seeing them all the time there. So the the marketers are able to reach me, uh, kind of in my in, with, with a little bit of my permission to to actually invade into my browsing space and show me the relevant ads. Now if they were showing ads for uh, for a 10 crore how will I in, in Devan only then I would be really upset because that's neither I want nor I can afford that right? so I don't want to see them but if that's something that I'm looking for it's a very timely kind of thing it makes sense uh, it could be integrated digital and physical element it does not have to be only limited to digital alone when we talk of digital it does not mean uh, as I will talk about in one of the sites there not everybody is going to be 100% digital not in the foreseeable future or, and probably never in the future Right? So we'll always have the physical components here. Product and services design. Today, depending on whatever is your reference, I'm sure you, you, you belong to either an Android CAM or you belong to a Microsoft uh, uh, operating, uh, mobile uh, CAM or an Apple CAM or something, right? Because you love the way those interactions are. You feel that it's an extension of my personality. It's an extension of my... Uh, my um, identity, right? That's how I. So, and you look for those same kind of experiences in products and services. Today, when you, for example, uh, there, were, there was this survey done uh, for millennials in the US last year, and they asked 10,000 millennials um, what what kind of uh, experiences are you expecting? And they said 54% of them said they are expecting digital experiences, but they believe their banks are incapable of offering them. And in fact, they ask them, what kind of experience, who do you think is going to most likely deliver those experiences to you? 73% of them said that futuristic banking experiences are most likely to come from companies such as Google, Apple and Amazon rather than my bank. That is the level of disruption. People are taking lateral experiences. So, uh, the, in fact, N N26 uh, founder uh, uh, I talked about earlier, he says, 
we want banking banking to be as easy as downloading from spotify because people have learned to use spotify much before they are opening a bank account and by the time they come they come to open a bank account their habits their expectations their user experience everything their mental models are all set around spotify or netflix i mean they say if i go on netflix i can or on on an amazon prime i can watch the movie and then i can break it and i i, I go on my second device and i can continue to resume from there and then i go to my third device and i can resume from there why i cannot do the same thing for banking why i cannot do the same thing for other kind of application so your competition if you are a bank is not from a bank your competition is amazon your competition is netflix your competition is spotify your competition is uber because those experiences are being cross pollinated and they are raising the bar all the time that is why product and services design is an extremely important part of those services platform discovery sign up onboarding how do you do that how do you get people on board how do you make sure that the whole onboarding process is seamless people are able to sign up fast enough right it's a fact that 99% of the apps that we download on our mobile they are not even open second time we just delete them if we run out of space or we don't just bother about uh, using them so how do you make sure that it's not just about an onboarding experience but it's actually about people using the apps that is an important part the ecosystem design uh, partners so for example uh, if you look at some of those unbundling uh, visuals that i showed not everybody is reinventing the bank not everybody is reinventing the retail store not everybody is reinventing the hotel what they are doing is they are doing a smart mash up of a lot of technology so some uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, for example loyalty program somebody is offering me visitation management somebody is offering me reservation system somebody is offering me back office somebody is offering me housekeeping and i'm kind of mashing them up and building a very smart way of integrating them that delivers a very holistic uh, customer experience <laughs> all that would be possible not by doing one off hacks but really only possible with kind of a platform approach there digital interface uh, design which is driven by customer experience data so when customer experience tells that hey this is how we love to use the product there and that's when you kind of respond to them that's the kind of a feedback that we're talking about so some of you might know for example one of my favorite example i talk about is there used to be this app uh, back in mid 2000s known as uh, uh, foursquare and foursquare was this app that which wherever you go so you come to no hotel you check in and you see you you upload on your social media and tell your friends Uh, that hey, I I checked into no hotel, and then they realized that people were kind of uh, using, but then they were only using one particular feature, and they were kind of ignoring everything else there. So they said, "What is that feature?" And the feature was come here to no hotel, take a picture, upload on your social media, uh, and this was like ten years, twelve years back. So the, nobody else was kind of offering it, and they they would just upload on the screen, and that was the only feature. So what did they decide to do with that? They said, "Let's take this feature out and build an independent product out of it." You all know the name of that product that came out of it. Anyone wants to tell? Instagram, one billion dollar value was created not by writing a line of code. Actually, by throwing away ninety percent of the code. So when we talk about coding and when we talk about architecture and we talk about all the fancy stuff, remember value. There was a time when there was a driver of value which was writing lines of code. But as Instagram has shown, because from Bourbon dot com to Instagram when it became. They threw away ninety percent of the code, and that's how they got to. So when we talk of, and I hope when you when you dwell deep on this in the next two days on technical agility, remember that technical agility is not about just taking care of the code that you have. It is also about being very ruthless and saying this is dead wood. Let me throw it away. Because if we are not throw, if we are not able to throw it away, you cannot create Instagram out of it. So, and that can only be possible when you are when you are respond listening and responding to the customer experience data. If you are ignorant of that and you say my job is only to launch and I am done, it's like one and done kind of a thing. No, sorry. Today's products are not a one and done kind of a thing. Today's products are continuous refinement all the time. And if you are not, if you are, if your eyes are not on the on the ground, ears are not on the ground, it's not going to happen. Uh, leverage social networking and mobile technology. I think we all understand that, and it's it's definitely changing, making the world more transparent about it. So that's the kind of a thing there. So these are some of the digital services that uh, I'm sure most of you would relate to that. I'm sure there might be some more, but uh, there might be a few more. Now, what are the digital technologies? This word has been thrown around a lot in the last few years. Again, there is no one single unique definition of that, and I'm kind of for the last few years trying to get my head around it and say, okay, what does really digital technology mean? I won't offer a definition, but I will offer 
some of the examples of what I consider as digital technologies, and that's a long list. So I can talk about automation, robotic process automation, AI, machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, understanding, generation, chatbots, big data, blockchain, IoT, Internet of Everything, uh, uh, social media networking, augmented reality, 3D printing. Uh, then we talk about uh, autonomous uh, self-driving cars. Uh, we talk about software platforms, APIs, and so on and so forth. In general, if you see the common theme is none of them is shipping atoms. All of them are shipping bits and bytes. They are creating a huge value exchange from a consumer, uh, from a producer to the consumer. And in order to do that, they are just talking about exchanging bits and bytes. So, to me, any technology that essentially is all about creating that rich set of uh, uh, value uh, is, uh, I would call as a digital technology, right? Uh, what, is, what about the way of working? Now, again, there is no single way of working, but what we are finding out from organizations that are kind of embarked on that, the way of working can actually in, uh, involve multiple facets of that. So, one of them is design thinking. We are talking really about people, type, and business. We are talking about stuff like empathy, ideation, prototyping. Then we are talking about business model canvas, right? And that's where we are talking about, hey, what kind of a business model makes sense to us? Should it be a subscription model? Should it be a pay-per-view? Should it be a premium model? Should it be a, a partnership model? Should it be an affiliate model? Then there could be a dozen of them. What is the problem solution fit? How do we really see whether I have the right solution in mind for the kind of problem that we are solving? And what is the value proposition design? Then I might move on to the whole uh, nine yards of lean startup where I start to talk about, hey, what is my minimum viable product? How do I really do that? Because I'm not going to wait for two years and work under stealth mode and then come up with this big shiny new product there with bombs there the, the, the moment it is launched. But I'm going to really try to get more feedback there and keep refining that as I go along in that. I do a lot of A-B testing, build, measure, learn, forward, uh, product market fit and so on. And then I come to human-centered design where I talk of things like personas and narratives and stories. Uh, I talk about things like ethnography because I know that my mental models could be very different from the mental models that my customers have. So unless I really engage in a purposeful ethnography, everything that I do can, can be a waste of time. Uh, and then finally, I come to the agile development because that is the way. To me, agile development at the end of the day is only about two things. It's one is all about having autonomous teams uh, which are basically embarking upon a mission and second is uh, a feedback driven short iterative cycle. Everything else is kind of uh, bells and whistles to that but end of the day one is the sociology of what the team is all about which is autonomous teams and second is how do they work is all about working uh, in, in short iterative loops which are driven by the feedback. So that's how I kind of see that way of working is kind of changing for uh, the businesses, uh, especially the digital businesses. Quickly going through the operation, it's all about org structure, design, governance, uh, uh, decision making, response mechanism, task design, communication, and finally talent management. We are not talking this year today, but these are kind of relevant issues for the digital organizations. How do they do that? The last thing I want to talk about quickly is the whole culture piece, right? And culture is something that we all visually, metaphorically, we re refer to it as an iceberg. The reason why we refer to it as an iceberg is because like an iceberg, only 10% is visible but 90% is under the water, it's not visible to us. Now what is visible in the organization are these processes and posters and uh, instructions and user manuals and reports and what have you. But this is only a tip of the iceberg, proverbially speaking. The real culture is what you will find in the hallways. The real culture is what you will find around the water coolers. The real culture is what you will find around the smoking corners. The real culture is also what you will find in the restrooms. That is how people collaborate. That is how people talk to each other. And my definition of culture is what and how people choose to work together. That is culture to me, not what is thrust upon them. What is thrust upon them is the company's corporate quality manual and processes. But what they choose to work with is what is the culture really, right? So, what are the, uh, so if you look at quickly from analog to digital, uh, it's a pretty slide, I'm not going to detail there. But this kind of a good summary of what it is. The whole idea is we're talking about a very flat organization, very responsive organization, where autonomous teams and quick decision making, uh, iteration, uh, which is based on the feedback, this kind of uh, the, the way to work and so on. Uh, there was a very interesting survey that was done by McKinsey uh, for, from Digital Quotient back in 2015 and what they found here was that these are the four factors that are critical for digital transformation and if you look at the third one, they said strong and adaptive culture. In fact, they valued it so much that they said even if 
happen to happen you have lesser of technical skills you can kind of make up for the loss or the lack of technical skills as long as you have the right culture so that is the real value of culture that is important for us to understand and when you look at the data that they said they said culture is the number one barrier in fact uh, i'm doing a course right now from from columbia business school on uh, digital uh, businesses and my professor uh, professor roger the first thing that i keep reading from his books and all is it's not about technology it's about culture people will get the technology we have seen enough generations of technology changes in the last four hundred years but it's about the culture that's really going to do that so what are the key things and and then last few slides here the first thing is about mindset when we talk about the mindset what is most important to understand is how people are really embracing the digital mindset instead of really looking at it i i went to one company and i was talking to them and i was kind of understanding and they said hey we are trying to become a digital products company and so on and we have these kind of fabulous products and 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 so on and i was just trying to i i was just testing the assumption and saying that theoretically if you have 10% less headcount available would you increase would that improve your productivity they said no it will decrease our productivity then i said you are not digital just a simple test the fact is you are driven by one bodies if you have 500 people you can get the some certain revenue if you have 700 people you have more revenue whereas 500 people in my way anyway big enough size more than uh, enough for a software product platform company you should probably be able to create uh, delivery at marginal cost for example when you go to dropbox today how much do you think it cost dropbox if five of you decide to open up a, a new account there it probably cost less than of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a cent it does not cost them to hire five more people in some part of the world and create a new customer service unlike a, a traditional service so when we talk about mindset we need to think of it as a digital mindset what will it take for me to really shift the bits and bytes as opposed to thinking in atoms here the second thing is about skills it's we need to understand that there is a new set of skills there i have identified five skills there which i am going to talk about there the picture is a representation also to say which is technical and which is soft skills so the first thing is tech obviously we need to understand some of the tech skills that i talked about right uh, and i believe that anyone who doesn't understand those tech skills uh, will probably have a, a challenge in getting an acquire, getting getting some kind of a gainful employment in the future ai machine learning big data iot blockchain i mean these things are just taken over uh, uh, what's happening there the second thing is the ability to automate there was a time when we were having we were seeking safety in the fact that oh i am the only guy in the company who knows how to do the black magic not anymore if you have to do push code push into production 100 times a day then even you will run out of bandwidth because every time you have to write a script and you have to kind of do that so think of how can you automate it because if you want to achieve the scale if you want to achieve the speed automation has to be done there automation in testing automation in builds automation in uh, deployment automation in monitoring all these things automation and roll back when the things don't go right right all that has to be a part of it the third thing is thinking of the platform there was a time when for example if you had to start a new business if you have to start an insurance business you would need to think of oh i am going to have for soldiers they are going to go out they are going to talk to the people they are going to offer insurance products not anymore well all you need to think of is in terms of the platform if you can solve the problem of discovery that people find out your website and then they come and then it is like do it yourself sales was just click 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 and you are all set that is digital service where the incremental cost of offering the services is marginal low the fourth is customer if we don't really understand understand and we can kind of get under the skin of the customer in terms of needs finding in terms of generating enough empathy about the kind of work that they are doing in terms of really understanding if they are delighted with, with, with the product or not then i don't think we'll be able to create those digital experiences because unlike the physical experience your customer could be sitting miles away and oceans away and you have no clue who the customer is they are talking in a different language they are their context of usage is very different there you don't even have a clue why are they using your product to begin with and that's that could be a big shame right so unless you really understand who is my customer why are they buying it what pain point do they have how are they doing it and all that is really a lot of soft skills that unfortunately our industry has downplayed in the uh, in last 20 years it's time for us to sign up for sociology classes ethnographic classes anthropology classes psychology classes and really learn some of the stuff from stream that we as hard technical community have kind of uh, looked down upon uh, for for so many years and the last thing is about team work so if customer skill was the people skill that was external facing then team work is kind of the skill that is internal facing how do you collaborate among the silos 
how do you manage your your way inside a 20000 people company how do you manage your way inside the political landscape uh, that is keeping the status quo alive in your company because you are trying to drive a change and you have to fight the uh, 40 years of history and 40 years of successful history that too it's not an easy thing so if you don't have people skills social skills it's going to be humongously uh, difficult and impossible to kind of do that so this is what i would kind of club them as them and as you can see the three fingers are meant to be hard skills and those two are really human skills uh, and and i think they have to go hand in hand autonomy in in, in agile and scrum we talk about them as self organizing teams i just use a little broader term autonomy in terms of what the team is capable of deciding what the team must decide and rearrange and shape shift itself in order to deliver the desired objectives there I want going to that because I'm sure all of us in this conference understand their collaboration is an important part of it because we are not talking about a homogeneous team anymore. In fact, we need to step out of our boundaries of uh, Scrum, Lean, Kanban, and get into a thing where we might be talking to people from market research and finance and customer service and tech support uh, and market research and and what have you. And these are not the people who report to you. These are not the people who speak your language. Their deliverables are different. Their metrics are different. Their way of working is different. If we do not understand what does it take for me to create a successful collaborative environment, then I might be a rock star in my own sense, but I'm not going to be very successful in delivering those. And and lastly, alignment is an important part of it. While we are talking about a digital world where there's a lot of decentralization and autonomous teams, we must understand that unless they are kind of uh, they are aligned to the true north, unless they are kind of aligned to the mothership. that that uh, will become a weak link because the individual team can keep doing it and then it's it's probably not going to kind of meet those things there so uh, alignment is an extremely important thing and in today's world um, through the digital channels we thankfully have a better opportunity to do that you want uh, if you are a ceo of a 40000 people company it doesn't mean that you have to go to all locations and address everyone all you need to do is webcast and all 40000 people can understand at the same time what is your message right so i think it's an important thing for all of us to understand if you are not the ceo but you are the project manager you still need to understand how are you going to make sure that you stay aligned to your manager right because it's very easy to drift apart when we are talking about autonomy so we have to make sure that there is a constant uh, realignment happening there so with that let me just uh, conclude uh, what i talked about um, when we talk about digital as i said we are really talking about a big paradigm shift we are not talking about just a literal uh, a linear uh, extension of what we have been doing so far and just kind of lift and shift and just uh, put a slap on the top of it some kind of a digital or an app or a web kind of an infrastructure we are talking about fundamentally rewiring the way work gets done there we are talking about creating a new kind of an organization structure we are talking about new kind of services that we are offering and in order to do that sustainably we need to do a lot of changes inside we need to change the kind of skills that we are talking about uh, for example one of the great case studies is there from ing bank uh, last year when they uh, when they went about uh, the whole agile transformation they looked at the skills very hard and said these mindsets don't make sense to us so we need to change them uh, they just didn't assume that the same mindset would automatically apply there the same way so some of you might have worked in the erp project before uh, if you especially worked in erp 5 10 15 years back and erp was this uh, uh, this uh, punching bag of, of of the whole industry because it was like no erp project was ever done on time probably right everything was two years late and three years late and customers were unhappy one of the biggest changes that we are seeing from the old implementation to the to the digital transformation is that instead of just a lift and shift approach in a digital transformation we are talking about reevaluating and rewiring the entire dna of the company So we are kind of changing the whole thing and saying this doesn't make sense. Eliminate it. This doesn't make sense. Eliminate it. This makes sense. Let's bring it back. We are in, in, in many sense ERP was just the digitalization of the existing manual processes. Yeah, I could be wrong, but that's how that was more of how it was happening there. So I think we need to understand that this has to be a restart of the company in in some sense. What if you were to start your own company and this is your day one? Are you going to design the same way and then you are going to bring digitalization, or you are going to say? Okay, throw away all these things because these are twentieth century models. They don't make sense. Let's bring it today. The value system, the sociology of the team, the design way of doing, the product development, customer integrity, uh, technology, and the services that uh, we are talking about. So uh, with that, I will I will stop here. I hope uh, I was able to give you a sense of uh, what does it really mean to operate in a digital uh, world and 
what is it really mean for the organizations and what are some of the pillars of the culture? Some of them have an overlap with Agile, uh, thankfully, so we can, uh, we, uh, us as a community, is very, we are lucky that we are able to kind of explain some of them, but one of the slides I didn't, uh, I, I kind of uh, move faster on that. One of the recently finding was 98% of the companies they believe are not a pure play Uber or Spotify or Netflix. 98% of the companies are companies that are offering hard physical products and services. And you can imagine how difficult it is to be, it's going to be for them to kind of deliver those uh, uh, digital experiences there. And I'm sure many of us fall into that 98% unless you are a company that was born yesterday, right? In, in which case it probably started out as a digital company on day one. But a lot of us have, have a legacy and we need to take care of it. And that's where I think culture will play a very important role because you have a lot of baggage that we'll have to clean up and we'll have to manage it and we'll have to kind of have chain leaders. I hope that it gives you some pointers and some directions to what are some of the priority areas uh, where it could have a big, uh, a higher bank for the part. So I think I'll stop there now and uh, I think I've run out of time. I saw a lot of uh, those time boards there, but I don't know if we have any time for any question left or not. Uh, but uh, in case we don't have any, I would like to thank you uh, and I hope it was a value and wish you all the best for the content. Thank you.